is great. It's great to be back here among my tribe, bootstrappers. I've done everything from bootstrapped all the way to raising 40-something million. I've experienced what Lloyd talked about in terms of being uh, fat during uh, VC funding and fit during bootstrapping. Um, so it's great to be here among uh, my tribe. I actually gave this presentation last year predicting that there would be a terrible recession coming. Uh, and lo and behold, I was uh, asked to give this again. And can you kind of guess why? It's kind of happening, right? You find it's kind of challenging out there, kind of selling stuff these days. Well, it is, and I tell you, I, I'll tell you how I got through it. I think it's actually going to be even more challenging this time. So I think a lot of the lessons that I learned from the dawn of SaaS still apply very much today, and some of the things that I work on with, uh, with my uh, coaching clients. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm a SaaS CEO coach. I've been in the arena now twice, uh, both in uh, founding, running Eloqua, and then uh, in Fluidive. Both got to over $100 million valuation and considerable ARR. Before that, I was a Bain consultant, so I do have a classic uh, training in addition to being a street fighting entrepreneur. So I have a little bit of both of those. Um, some of the things that I work on with my clients, category design, uh, how to design and build your great category, executive hiring, how to get the product market fit, operational rhythm, all this other kind of stuff. But I'm going to take you back a little bit. I don't have a fancy slide here like Lloyd. It's a hand-drawn slide. I hope you appreciate it. A little bit about my emotional state as uh, I built this first, uh, first company. So I started... Eloqua, which has uh, become you know, the iconic marketing automation software company. I built it right out of the office in Bain. So I didn't actually win my first customer until I was, I was still actually at the firm. And that was really exciting. So you see here on the, on the left-hand side, first customer, it's because I read in a startup book that you should always try to make your suppliers your customers. And so our real estate agent, a real estate company that, that helped us get our first space, we made them our very first customer. It became Cushman and Wakefield, so it's really not a bad first customer to have. And lucky in that it was a B as a business. It was not a consumer company. So I actually got our start in uh, B2B where doing uh, chat and email marketing, that was kind of an original thing. So it's great. One of our first customers, super exciting to go and get that check. Um, and then, of course, the tech wreck in 2000, right in the middle of my funding round, I was able to raise $166,000, and that was all the money that I raised in order to get profitable. Um, so that was a bit of a, down, uh, a, bit of a downer. Um, and then a really tough recession. So 2001 to 2004, marketing budgets literally went to zero. No marketing budget at all. Somehow we had to figure out how to sell and market in that environment, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and then I was lucky enough to meet my first mentor, Bill Tatham. Uh, who was CEO of a company called Jana Systems, which is in the CRM space, and um, you know was a first partner of Eloqua. And I was really lucky in that he hated VCs, like really hated them. And so I was telling him about how tough it was for me to raise money, and he made me a deal. He said, I will mentor you. You come and see me every quarter and do everything that I tell you to do. And if you do, you will have a profitable company in less than a year. Like, sounds like a deal, right? So anyway, um, I followed his plan and actually did end up becoming a profitable company, but not before I raised an absolutely brutal round. And I've heard a number of people complain about tough fundraising conditions and really tough terms. So how about this for terms, okay? $300,000 loan that I had to pay back within a year. I gave up 20% of the company for that, for a $300,000 loan to pay back a year. And it gets even better. If I didn't pay it back in a year, I'd have to give another 20%. So that's tough funding conditions, right? I did it. You got to swallow the pride. And then I said, you know what? We're going to get profitable so we never have to do this shit again, right? All right, so that's what we do. And we built a profitable company um, transformation with a number of the ideas that we're going to talk about today, how to target niche markets, uh, how to figure out the X factor of your business, okay? How to go and make the business run faster, sustain profits. Big jagged line, many times almost close to death, three near bankruptcies along the way, lots of fun, lots of learning. Um, did manage to raise a Series A, not because I needed the money, actually, because I was already profitable, but because I had a bunch of dicks on my board I had to get rid of. So I used that money that I raised a Series A mostly to buy those guys out. Also, I had the inkling that this marketing automation thing was becoming like a real thing, and that maybe at some point 
uh, there might be competitors in the market. That did happen. Marketo and HubSpot founded 2006, 2007. It was a good thing that I raised some money. Um, a lot of fighting with my co-founder at the time. Some of you may experience that. I spent increasing time in Europe and Asia where I didn't have to deal with them, and I could be an entrepreneur again. Uh, raised my Series B actually while I was in London. Um, and, uh, but that might have led to uh, one of the reasons why I was let go from the company. Even though the company was doing very well, uh, a lot of fights with co-founders, arguments with board of directors, and I ended up actually losing a job, thrown out of the company that I founded. I had a bunch of random jobs along the way, and then finally IPO, big success, and it became a, a billion dollar a success story. So that's my, um, that's my journey. It started with very humble beginnings. So a lot of you may not know, you might think of Eloqua as uh, email marketing, website tracking, kind of like Marketo and HubSpot, kind of company, right? It's not how it started. It actually started kind of like Intercom, um, you know, or like a live person. It was like a chat company. So this is kind of how it started, chat window in 1999. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why is that the, the reason why I created the company in the first place was the insight that I had from Bain that um, if you can use the internet to connect the right uh, buyers with salespeople, you might have a business there somewhere. So the focus is actually on sales, not on marketing in the beginning. So we literally created software that uh, embodied that. Um, now, the lucky thing in this is because our first customer was B2B, um, we had to track prospects on that website. We had to connect the right sales rep with that prospect. And because of that, we ended up building some pretty unique architecture that really uh, uh, was original at the time. Um, and so uh, the problem is that nobody really wanted to chat uh, for real estate. <laughs> so what we did is we put an email engine on top of that to drive more traffic to go and chat. Still not a lot of interest in chatting, but as a result, we got kind of lucky. And that combination of website tracking and email became our MVP. So this way, sales reps could identify which prospects were ready for a conversation and then focus on them in order. And that became a big hit. And that was actually the MVP of Eloqua. So, uh, that's, it's interesting how chance really favors a prepared mind. Go build a product. It probably isn't going to work exactly how you intend, but if you have the right process, you can kind of understand where, where you may be able to pivot to. And um, then it became the technology that you're probably all familiar with today if you use market automation, where you've got this kind of flow builder that um, draws people through a bunch of sort of organized touch points uh, that has now become a $30 billion industry worldwide. It's pretty amazing what started as very uh, humble beginnings and multiple near bankruptcies and the like. So the reason why I succeeded was um, with the help of great mentors and coaches, including this first guy on the left, Vince Shirelli, may, may he rest in peace, my very, one of my first angel investors, and he was a sales trainer, which is lucky for me, um, because uh, I didn't know how to sell, and uh, he let me know that I should go through sales training. But one of the things that he taught me was that you can't manage results, you can only manage your activity. I hope you take that away from today. You can't manage your results. It's only about the high quality and quantity activity that you do every day that you're going to be successful. What I learned from my very first mentor. But I'm going to tell you about a number of my mentors and coaches that I had and why I succeeded and why I myself became a coach in the end because of what I learned. So the first is I mentioned Bill Tatham. Bill Tatham was not a fan of SaaS at all. He thought it was a pricing construct. So he was wrong about that, but he was sure right about how to build a profitable business. And indeed, I did build a profitable business within a year. The first thing is, Focus on a much more tight vertical niche than really you might even be comfortable with. You heard this a little bit from Lloyd as well. So he didn't just target financial services. He didn't just target wealth management. He just targeted the biggest bulge bracket uh, investment banks in the world. And he won seven out of seven of them, right? And that was one of the reasons why he sold his company to Tom Siebel, because Tom Siebel was so pissed off every time he went on Wall Street. He says, what about Janus Systems? And he's like, fuck those guys. I go buy them, all right? So that's uh, a big lesson. And I did the same thing. I first focused on finance, insurance, and real estate. Being in Toronto, that's kind of big industries there. Finance and insurance weren't a really good fit because they didn't really need leads that much, qualified leads. Um, but the real estate ended up being a great sector, focused on vacation real estate there, and then found an even better sector in the software business. Um, but then just focus on any software companies, focused on big software companies in Northern California. Very much taking my lesson from Bill, we were bootstrapped. Uh, if they weren't on the Caltrain line, we couldn't really afford to go see them because I couldn't really afford a rental car. <laughs> so it was definitely a tough thing. Strange budgets. I mean, you see that today. So back in 
uh, this time, sort of 2002-ish, there was a fetish around uh, Six Sigma, which you may have heard of. It's kind of like this science of minimizing variance, particularly for manufacturing-oriented businesses. So I said, ha, ah, if this is what people are spending money on, maybe we'll become the Six Sigma of marketing. Um, it was a little bit of BS, but it worked. Uh, and we used that to sell into a division of GE and then subsequently more divisions of General Electric, Motorola, and some other companies that were involved in Six Sigma. You see that today in AI. There are companies that actually have budgets that are separate from everything else, just focused on AI. There's other strange budgets to sell into. Another budget that is sold into, and also relevant today in a recession, is in the sales budget. So marketing budgets are being cut right now, just as they were uh, back in, um, in 2001, but people still need to train their sales reps. They still need to develop those sales reps, hire those sales reps. Sold into that budget, okay, because I was able to show that the best way to support your sales reps is to give them qualified leads, not to have them waste their time on bad leads. So it worked and sold into a number of sales budgets where the sales division, sales leader, helped marketing pay for the solution. I think this is a very relevant practice that you can use today, and you're probably gonna have to because a number of your budgets are gonna get cut. Servicization of the business. So one of the things I learned from Bill is that if you're focused enough, you can charge for your expertise, right? Today, when you do needs analysis, are, are, do, does anybody pay you for that? Well, probably not, right? I mean, you do it because you wanna develop new customers. What if instead you made it a workshop what if instead you charged for it? Well, that's one of the things that I learned for Bill, started charging for workshops, and also increased our prices big time. He said, triple your prices, and we did. Okay, we went from $1,000, 1,500 a month, up to $4,000 plus a month. And we could do that because we were experts. People trusted us. And we also increased our professional standards so that we acted more like professional consultants and less like 25-year-old software guys, <laughs> which is what we were. Okay, so that's what I learned from Bill. Um, second thing, I learned was the X factor. Uh, anybody heard of Vern Harnish here who wrote Rockefeller Methods, wrote Scaling Up? So I went to a seminar from him, and this is when I was about six months away from running out of cash and being absolutely dead as a doornail. I'd sold every asset I had. Um, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, uh, literally dipped into her medical school loans in order to keep my business alone, alive. It was tough. I went to this seminar here from, um, from Vern. He talked about this amazing story from Wayne Huizenga, who still is the only founder to create three Fortune 500 companies from nothing. Okay, he, this guy's like the Babe Ruth of startups, and you guys probably haven't even heard of him. Okay, the Elon Musk of the time. Um, and this is the way he did it. The way he made three successful Fortune 500 startups, he asked this question. How do we take the most annoying, costly, and risky aspect of our industry and turn it to nothing? How do we do that? Um, and he did that, for example, Blockbuster Video by making sure that Blockbuster had the first run movies, of, uh, first run of every movie, so that people who went to the store always got the first run movie. Outback Steakhouse made sure that there's minimal turnover of the, the management staff which was the biggest cost at the time by giving them part ownership in the business. So of course I went to my team and said, hey, how do we, sorry, uh, missed a slide here, that's all right. How do we do this with our own business? What is the most costly and risky aspect of our company? And what it was at the time was at um, uh, educating a customer. We had a brand new solution, it was a new category. And we had lots of interest in the product, but a very low close rate. And so that was the biggest cost in the business. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to get pre-educated customers. Where do you get pre-educated customers? Your competitor. So we had a big competitor at the time who raised $48 million. And that was a king's ransom back in 2001. Still is a lot of money today, not nearly as much. And so we hashed a plan to go after our biggest, co biggest competitor. And to this day, is the most fun I've ever had in business. Imagine having your entire company just focused on one goal of destroying your biggest competitor. Sales, marketing, product, engineering, that's all we focused on doing, taking their, those customers that are already pre-educated. Um, and it worked. In a few months, we had, one of their customers was, uh, was a division of GE, as I mentioned, won them, then won a bunch of others, um, and basically used that as a way uh, to help get profitable uh, much faster. And I'm gonna tell you about the method that we used about that a little bit later. Um, another big idea is elevate the system bottleneck. Eliyahu Goldratt, have you ever uh, heard of the book The Goal or read the book The Goal? 
It's just a mind-blowing book, okay? It, it may not sound like much on the surface. It's about manufacturing. It's about a manufacturing plant and how to optimize a manufacturing plant by maximizing throughput and minimizing the inputs and the operational expense to convert inputs to outputs. And you're probably thinking, why does that matter? Well, you can model a software company the same way. Okay, your software company is also a manufacturing plant. What are you manufacturing? Deliriously happy customers. That's what I think you're manufacturing, okay? So the idea is you can't go any faster than your bottleneck. If you identify your system constraint, then you can work on minimizing that instead of all your local constraints, and you can have a much more efficient company. If you're like most companies, you have a sales, marketing, customer success, product, engineering, operations organizations, right? Each of them operate often in silos. What if you get everybody working together in unison, all rowing in the same direction? That's this idea, okay? So you do that by elevating the system bottleneck. And so you start by saying, okay, maybe the bottleneck in our funnel is converting first meetings into closing meetings with a sales rep, okay? If that's the case, why would we invest in generating way more leads at the front? Why would we invest on generating more upsells on this end? Why don't we get marketing helping sales by generating more ROI models and that sort of thing, okay, case studies. Let's get customer success moving earlier in the process to help close more deals. Then we alleviate the system bottleneck, and now there's a new constraint somewhere, and we can go and address that. So part of what I did as CEO, and what I think you can do is help your teams focus on the number one issue, get everybody focused there instead of all over the place and diffuse. Um, Okay, so what is the relevant inputs, throughputs, operation expenses for a SaaS company? As I said, I think we can model a SaaS company very simply as a manufacturing plant that starts with awareness on one side and then generates very happy customers on the other end to advocate for you. And so where's your system bottleneck? It's just like a factory. Look up to the ceiling. Wherever you see things piled up to the ceiling, that's your bottleneck. Same thing with a software company. Where your funnel is misshapen, that is where your bottleneck is. Get everyone focused there. All right, crank up the OODA loop. Anyone heard of the OODA loop? Observe, orient, decide, and act. Amazing, mind-blowing framework. It'll change your life if you apply this, okay? And it was created by a fighter pilot named John Boyd. And he was asked to figure out why in the Korean War did the American planes do so much better than the Russian MiGs at the time. And um, he was an ace fighter pilot, and he came up with this model. So think about a dogfight in the air, right? You're a fighter pilot now. You have an enemy that's there. What do you need to do? Where is he? What's he doing? Then you got to make a decision, and you got to act. And the idea is if you can turn this loop faster than your competitor, then you're going to win. You're going to operate your OODA loop inside of their OODA loop. And so once we figure out what the system bottleneck is, what do we do with it? We're going to OODA it. Okay? We're going to observe what are, what's going on. We're going to understand what is our new view of the world, make decisions and act, and you want to do it very quickly. And how do you do this very quickly? You're going to meet very frequently and have a very fast operational tempo of meetings. And, uh, and, and that's a big learning that I had. So first we want to get the whole company focused on one thing. In this one case, it was focused on defeating this big competitor. And my next company, Influitive, where I had a huge churn problem, the focus was on killing churn. And so I had everybody in the company focusing on killing churn. All the customers we had on a board, all the factors of what would make them retain over here. Every day for 15 minutes, what are we doing to retain more customers? So very rapid focus, very rapid tempo of operations. I'm a big fan of having daily meetings, even daily all hands meetings, um, so that we get this tempo going faster and we learn faster as a company, okay? All right, make them an offer they can't refuse. We may know that this guy here in the middle, from The Godfather, another big idea from Eliel Goldride, who wrote a next book after the gold called It's Not Luck, and it was focused on sales and marketing, and this is a big idea. So most of us, most people, most founders, are really obsessed about their products, Okay, a lot of come from an engineering or product background, even the ones that don't really love the solution that they have. Instead, what I'd love you to get focused on more are the pains that your users and customers have and what is irresistible to them. So that's the question that we ask. What would be irresistible that our customers just 
could not buy, could not afford not to buy. Um, and how do we do that is by understanding their metrics. What are your customers' metrics of success? How do we align your company together with those metrics? How do we radically reduce the risk for them to adopt? So what we did at Eloqua was the big risk was that the thing was not launched on time and it wasn't going to generate the metrics of success. So what we did was, okay, we'll guarantee you success. You get your money back if you don't get success and you will launch within a week guaranteed. So we would show up on Monday, they would pay a lot of money for training and development, all that stuff, but we would guarantee their money back. And on Friday, they would launch their marketing campaigns. It was unprecedented in our industry, and we took away the big risk, and that way they could opt faster. I've taken a lesson from my own thing here, and even in the coaching business, it's not an easy time. A lot of SaaS companies don't have money these days. I've also radically reduced the risk for people to work with me. If you're interested, we could talk about it after. All right. Uh, Fred Reichelt, uh, you might have heard of the book, Ultimate Question. You probably know Net Promoter Score. He's a creator of that. He also wrote a book called The Loyalty Effect before that. And he talked about not just the importance of having loyal customers, but having loyal employees and shareholders as well. So one of the ways that we stayed alive was that uh, we sold our stock super cheap to employees and all their family members. 10 cents a share, real cheap. Um, and so we didn't have to lay anybody off. We we're able to um, raise quite a bit of money from our own people. And as a result, uh, they were really motivated and highly engaged employee shareholders. Some of them had two, three, four percent of the company. And as a result, created a lot of multimillionaires inside the company that I'm quite proud of today. Also, I, I had some people on my board, investors that Honestly, we're not friendly to the company. We have to get rid of those people. Um, and uh, I, I think you know, your board is a team too. Just like your management is a team, your board needs to operate as a great team. And then, so if people are not really on board, buy them out when you can. Uh, finally, so David Scott, who's a repeat amazing speaker here at SaaS Uh He's a general partner at Matrix. I may be one of the few that turned down one of his term sheets uh, because I, he won't. He wanted to uh, force me to move to Boston um, for my Series A. So I did turn down this great man's term sheet, but he's became a great friend along, the, uh, along the, the years. And he told me the most riveting story that'll just blow your mind. And it's on his website called forentrepreneurs.com, and it's about the one-day sales cycle. And in the one-day sales cycle, he tells the story of how he sold a year's worth of software in a single day. How awesome is that? Well, here's the story. So back in the, in the 80s, when he was an entrepreneur in South Africa, not exactly a hotbed of software selling, um, he was very frustrated because people weren't buying his stuff. You guys experience that? People aren't buying your stuff at the rate you'd like to. Well, he's an engineer by background, so he went out in the field using his engineering toolkit to figure out why the hell people weren't buying his stuff fast enough. And so what he did was he cataloged all the steps that buyers needed to go through physically and emotionally, what they needed to go through in order to move through that buying process, which included getting education, which included getting references, um, and all this other stuff. And what he did is he put them all in one time and place. He organized a ballroom event with a comedian to get people all lubed, liquored up. And he put all these things together. He put prospects together with customers together, happy customers together. And the only thing he forgot was to have people on board to take orders. <laughs> and as I said, he sold a year's worth of software in a single day. It's pretty amazing. But a big lesson here is about talk with references. So a great way to accelerate your buying process is to get your customers helping your prospects become customers. A big lesson for me and so powerful that I actually created a new company out of it. Once I uh, left my last one, I wrote a book called The Messenger is a Message. So if you're interested in the art and science of getting your customers to do all the selling, marketing, and product for you, because they're better at it than you are, and they're better at it than your employees are, then uh, this book is available on Amazon. It's like 10 bucks or something on a Kindle. Um, you know, also got some insight as being a founder as a long-term career. So the idea here is hopefully you guys are not just creating one company. You guys are going to create companies for your whole life, as I have. Um, find a 20% in your last company that provides 80% of the value, triple down on that. And that's what I've done now at Category Knots, where today uh, I'm a coach, I love my work, I love helping uh, founders, CEOs, and half of my clients are bootstrapped, 
uh, got them all profitable so that they're able to raise money if they want. Uh, and specifically, I look for people who want to create a category, who don't just want to build a Me Too product. That's not exciting for me. But if you are excited about a whole new world that you want to create, a whole new ecosystem of value, um, and want to build something great, then I'd love to talk to you. Um, yeah, so that's it for today. And uh, look forward to uh, you know, your conversations after. Thank you, Mark.